The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. I'm Ben Heck. And I'm Tom Dimitrovich. Today we're on the road down in St. Louis at Eaton, which is a company that deals with circuit protection, circuit breakers, and fuses. One popular brand they are involved with that you probably have heard of is Busman Fuses. But today we're gonna to be talking about things a little bit bigger than those little glass fuses you might find in your car. As Eaton, we make circuit breakers and fuses for all different types of applications. So today we're going to see a cable whip demonstration with and without overcurrent protection. We're gonna see an arc flash event with and without overcurrent protection, and a surge event with and without surge. To start, we're going to take a look at the facility where the power is actually generated. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. How can we make this portable? Inspired designs. I am the internet troll. Regrettable acting. Them hatches. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. All right, so as you walk in, the first thing you see are very large uh, transformers. Uh, these are rated at 20 MVA. They're about 42 tons each. Their job is to step down the voltage uh, from medium voltage off the generator to the low voltage we see in the test cell. Uh, it can be 600 volts, 250 volts AC. On the primary side, as I mentioned, it can be up to about 9 kV. That's considered medium voltage in the power industry. Uh, immediately upstream of our transformers, you'll see our three-phase load bank. We've got almost 400 resistors and almost 40 reactors that we can switch in and out. And uh, what those do is they'll adjust our current and they'll also adjust our power factor. Um, these are actually just switches that you'll see up here, pneumatically actuated switches, electrically controlled, and those will put in and out um, these reactors that you can kind of see below. So no one ever actually touches this. That's right, these are remote actuation. Uh, immediately upstream of our load banks, you'll see we've got some synchronous closing switches. Um, now these are very specialized switches. You can't really go in and buy these anywhere. You can't go on Amazon or Walmart and purchase these. What they do is they allow us to close where we want um, on the voltage wave. We can close within uh, about three electrical degrees in terms of accuracy. So that's really, really accurate. So you're able to create a controlled voltage spike or change that might happen randomly in real life. Exactly, that's right. We, right. we have to make sure that it's a, it's a worst case scenario when we're testing our product. All right, this is actually the SF6 uh, interrupter. This is not used very often, but when we're doing very high current calibrations, we wanna make sure we operate this. Um, this is kind of backup protection for our main breaker right there. It kind of has its back to us. Um, but that's about a 1200 amp breaker, and that kind of does the majority of the load breaking. These closing switches can't break loads, but they can close onto faults. So you have fault protection for your testing of fault protection. That's right. <laughs> okay, so we must be getting pretty close to the generator now. That's right, so here's our generator output. Uh, as I mentioned, 9 kV if we're at 100% uh, excitation on this side. 15.5 kV if we're at 100% excitation on that side. Uh, the generator has two output coils and we can put them in parallel or series based on if we need more current or if we need more voltage. So we've got some flexibility there. And then this is the big guy right here and it's a stored energy system. So how do we get that 37.5 MVA continuous? It's only driven by a 1500 horsepower motor. But what it does is it gets up to speed uh, without any load. It takes about 10 minutes to get up to speed and then the inertia of that 32 ton rotor uh, is really how we can get that, that output. Uh, this end right here is the brushless DC exciter. So we can scale that up from zero to 100% excitation. So that corresponds to zero to nine kV or whatever we want to test at. So kind of some flexibility as far as test voltages. We have a pretty good view of everything from this point. So to sum it up. Yeah, so our, our big machine, our generator, gives us a, a medium voltage that's you know controlled with our switching. Uh, goes through our load banks where it's the, the current's adjusted, the power factor's adjusted if it's AC. Then it's stepped down through the transformers on either side, and then from there it could go through a rectifier for our DC side, otherwise it's right up to the test board. So this is quite literally a small power plant. Yes, it is. I could, I could, that's one way to put it. <laughs> so what is this demonstration here, Pat? 
Well, the demonstration we're going to show you is uh, called a wire whip test. Uh, what we're going to do is put a short on our test board, and this is basically just 20 feet of uh, 2 watt wire, and we're going to show the magnetic forces associated with fall current, protected and unprotected. Three, two, one, fire. <laughs> Tom, that wire whip event was pretty violent. Why did that happen? Why did it fling across the floor? Mate, you saw magnetic forces. We can't see it by the naked eye, but we can see what the result of magnetic forces. Those conductors wanted to push themselves away from each other. Just like when you have two magnets with the same polarity, they want to push themselves away, we create an electromagnet. So basically what's happening is um, there's so much current running through the wire, it, tr it tries to go into the form of the magnetic field. Yes. And repel itself back into a circle, which causes whoo, uncontrolled motion. Absolutely and that can injure someone. So it's not a shock danger, it's a physical damage danger. Right, yeah. yeah so, so what we saw was a wire, but in, in an electrical distribution system, all those wires are landed on terminals, and that all puts stress. So if you don't have the right torque, you don't bolt the equipment to the walls correctly, that stress can actually take that equipment off the wall and have it land up on the floor. And if you're around it, like that dummy. And that could lead to even more short circuits. Absolutely. So now what we're gonna do is run that same demonstration with the proper circuit protection. Three, two, one, fire. Woo, that fuse is really warm after the event, but it successfully cleared the fault. It did, and the energy that we saw that was expelled in the conductor in the last event was actually absorbed by this fuse, inside the fuse, by isolating the fault very quickly. So we saw the wire move a little bit, and that was right before this thing actually cleared the fault. Correct. Oh man, fuses are important. This is the arc flash event test chamber. This is going to be testing a short across three phase power. Three phase is what you have in large factories, your power lines overhead, serious stuff, way beyond anything you might come across in the home. And it's going to be a dead short. There's copper wire wrapped around all three. And this is going to be pretty catastrophic. It's going to actually vaporize the copper. So as far as danger is concerned, it's not just the you know, burn or you know, electrocution or shock. It's also the vapors you might inhale, like the gases and you know, copper that's turned into vapor. You don't want to breathe that. So a lot of things can go wrong. That's why I'm going to be nowhere near this when it goes off. Three, two, one, fire. That arc flash event was nuts. I can't imagine being down there where that dummy was. That's a lot of energy expended. It's, uh, you're looking at 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's warmer than the surface of the sun. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking like plasma torch temperatures. Right, so we had a little wire there that yeah. was trying to absorb all that energy and we went from a solid state to vapor within a blink of an eye. The copper was vaporized? The copper was vaporized. And you also said that people have caused arc flash events with um, meters, like yeah. testing, and the meter's not rated for what they're testing. And instead of it you know, flashing through a piece of copper, it actually goes through the meter. Yeah, so now you have plastics and uh, electronics that become vaporized instantly. That's insane to think about. And you're saying that it can basically, it just wipes out everything in its path. It's like kind yes. of like a, a ball where nothing exists anymore. You, you've taken all of the steel, the copper, and after an arc flash event where you have that ball of plasma that could be inhaled, and after the event, after the cleanup comes in, you realize how much of that material, how much steel is missing, how much copper is missing. That handheld little meter is nowhere to be found. Right. 
So the arc flash event is basically about a lot of current, a lot of available current going through a conductor that is really not intended to. Correct. Okay, so arc flash events are very dangerous and they can hurt you in a lot of ways. Can we see that same demonstration but properly fused? Yes. Three, two, one, fire. So far, we've seen an arc flash event and a wire whip. What other sort of electrical problems that need protection should we think about? We should always think about surge. I've heard of surge protectors and seen them in stores. Tell me more. Surge protective devices help protect our sensitive electronic equipment, like our stereo systems, uh, it's safety equipment like smoke detectors and things of that nature. They all have microprocessor driven boards and electronics and years ago we didn't have electronics at homes. Today we do, so they're much more sensitive to power surges that you may see from a utility or even from within the facility or your home. So are you going to blow up a $5,000 Macintosh computer? That would be awesome, but no, we're going to blow up a uh, light bulb, a standard light bulb. Okay, that works for me. Let's go try it out. We're here in the Surge Lab with Austin Function. And what they do here is safely test surges on devices. In this case, a light bulb. So we have here a power strip, which is not the same as a surge protector? That's correct. They may look very similar when handling the product. They will all have multiple outlets, just like you would normally see in your home. The difference is, is a true surge strip will actually have little discs buried inside and will actually help protect against surges. They both have, obviously, all of the outlets hooked in and connected but the difference will be whether it has those discs in parallel to divert the energy. So how do we know what to look for when we're buying these in the store? So when you buy, buy these in a store, you'll see a lot of times what's called a voltage protection rating, or sometimes for the older devices, a clamping voltage, which will kind of let you know where it will level off the energy and keep it from hitting all of your equipment. Okay, so what we're looking for is a UL rating on the device. Yeah, UL 1449, third edition. All right, well, let's see what happens when there's a surge without that kind of protection. Tom, that must have been quite the surge. I've never seen a light bulb explode in my home before, but surges are common. Why did that happen? That was a 3,000 amp surge, and, and a light bulb just can't handle that much current in that short period of time. Right, so again, it's worst case scenario. Absolutely. All right, so if that was a computer or a hair dryer or a microwave or a Cuisinart yes. or a plasma television, or a bowling ball polisher, it probably would have been destroyed. Absolutely, but sometimes it doesn't take the very large surge to damage the equipment. Small surges over time, it's like, it's like dropping water on a soap, bar soap. Or like high blood pressure where eventually it ruins exactly. your cardiovascular system. Absolutely. We've seen what can happen when a surge destroys a light bulb. Can we now see a light bulb protected from that same surge? Yes, we're gonna put a surge protective device now in the circuit, which will clamp that voltage and shunt the current to ground. Instead of sending it to the light bulb and blowing it up, we'll protect it. Wow, Tom, nothing happened. I'm impressed. That surge device protected that light bulb, but it could have been a very expensive computer system. All right, so it's basically important to protect anything electric in your home. Absolutely. Well, Tom, it's been really interesting learning about all the ways that circuits can fail, what happens when they fail, and how to prevent them from failing in the first place to prevent bodily harm to people and, of course, equipment as well. It was great having you today, Ben. Yeah, thanks. It's been a great trip to St. Louis. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Be sure to tune in next time and go to element14.com forward slash TBHS to learn about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Now we're going to do that same example with proper surge protection. <laughs> Fuse is really warm after that event, but it did prevent massive, well, massive destruction. <laughs> and a hundred years ago, that light bulb would have been worth like a hundred dollars. You'd have to, you'd have to work in the Model T factory for a year. <laughs> Oh man, that fuse is really warm, but it did prevent the event. Prevent the event? That's garbage. That light bulb was toast. Yes.
How come I never? <laughs> The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.